Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a series for the first three months of 2016 entitled Rebellion and Redemption. It's really the story of the great controversy as told in Scripture and with a few additions from Ellen White. This particular lesson is lesson number five in that series for January 30 of 2016, and it's entitled, The Controversy Continues. Now, some very significant stories here about Old Testament characters. Before we jump into it, we'd like to ask you to join us for a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, we thank you for these reminders of what you have done in the past, of how you dealt with your children despite their foibles, and it gives us courage to know that you're very considerate and loving and kind as you deal with us also in our day. May we learn from these stories things that will be of benefit for us and those who have an opportunity to listen in in preparation for that soon coming that we so much pray for and hope for as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> The Bible is full of real-life heroes. Their stories have been taught as children's stories for generations. And of course, when we, when we use them as children's stories, we pick out the nice parts and we don't mention some of the not-so-good parts. But that's okay. That's fine for children. Um, What's the nice part about David killing Goliath? We win against the enemy. Every kid wants to win against the enemy, right? <laughs> okay. What is that teaching them? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, what did these stories tell us? If we now want to take a slightly more mature approach to them, what do they tell us about the great controversy between God and Satan? Today we're going to be talking about David, Elijah, Hezekiah, Esther and Nehemiah. I hope you have all those stories clearly in mind because um, we're going to touch on them. We don't have time to deal with them in depth. We're going to look, we're going to look at some parallels and maybe some distinctions between these stories, see what we can learn. And we're going to ask questions like, what kind of troubles did these people face? What kind of obstacles did they face in trying to serve God? I mean, think about Esther. Think about Elijah. Think about David. And one of the questions we need to ask, since our main question is about God, why does he seem to act with such force at times, but other times he just sort of stands by? So that's one of the questions we'll want to ask particularly. Um, have you ever noticed how God seems to act very forcefully when his name and his character are directly challenged? Think about coming out of Egypt. People thought that the Israelites' God was useless and un not powerful at all until he was pitted up against the Egyptian gods, and then, wow, we have the plagues, right? And there's other places. But let's, let's look at that kind of idea in our stories for today. A correct understanding of God and his character and government <laughs> makes it possible for us to Rejoice in God's victory, even as we face difficult trials and evils in our day. We've got to remember, despite the difficulties which might be happening to us, even to our church, God has already done what? He's already won the great controversy. <coughs> There's not any possibility that God will lose. So how do we fit into that picture? Is there some way in which Jesus wins for us? Or do we need to do something to participate in that victory? Um, so let's go and look at some of the stories. David and Goliath. You know the story. He goes down there to uh, take some food to his brothers. And of course, I'm sure the father wants to know, are these brothers still alive? And he hears this giant coming down on the other side of the valley. I had the privilege of visiting the place where this happened um, a couple of summers ago, and it's not much of a valley. 
Um, I had always pictured it as being a fairly deep valley, and there's two sides sort of. There's not much of a valley there unless it's unless it's changed somehow or other since uh, since David's day. But anyway, there they are. The giant comes out and he shouts, "Okay, send out your man to 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 fight with me." And what does David do? When no one else would go out, uh, he volunteers to go out and fight the giant. And, De and, and, and Saul very graciously offers to loan him his armor. Yes. <laughs> Was that a good idea? No. Well, f first of all, David gets a little upset at this uncircumcised Philistine as right. making these accusations against. Mm -hmm. That's what he's incensed about. Is that, is that, is that well, yeah, it's, it's a direct attack against mm -hmm. God. You know, <clears throat> come on, you guys. You're supposed to be serving this great God, and you're supposed to be so powerful. You send out just one person. Don't you have one guy that can come out here and fight with me? Well, preferably the king. He would be the one, the guy that's supposed to come out, isn't he? Well, that's what they would love, yeah, <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> and was Saul, was Saul braving his way down there? No. Saul was head and shoulders above everyone else, they say, but uh, well, he that, wasn't often. Isn't that the issue, though? The, um, everybody's looking at size. I mean, they, they pick the king because of size, mm -hmm. so everything's going to be good because this guy's so big. And then the Goliath comes, makes Saul look like a shrimp. <laughs> and, then, and then they're all wondering <laughs> what's going on, and then this... David, who's even smaller than Saul, it's comes up stripling. and says, what's going on here? You know, you know, I'd never thought of that before. I'm glad Gary brought that, that comparison up. But, you know, <clears throat> that's what the people said they wanted. They, they wanted uh, and a big, tall guy to, to lead him in battle. That's right. Where and, was he now when they're at a battle? That's right. they, He's hiding in his tent. That's right. Well, not only that, but that's that's what they wanted when they wanted a king. Yeah. That's, that's why they precisely. picked Saul, yeah. Yeah. So what does David do? He says, no, I can't fight in this armor. So imagine, here's Goliath. He's coming down, and he has not only himself with all his armor on, he has what else with him? A armor sword. Bear. An armor bearer. A bear and a helmet. The whole Someone thing. is supposed to protect him. Have you ever wondered what the armor bearer was doing while David was cutting off Saul's, I mean, uh, Goliath's head? He was doing what everybody else was doing. He was running. <laughs> <laughs> that was probably true. He wasn't much of a help, was he? Well, of course, David picks up his stones from the stream, as we always sing in that children's song. And one stone, and with that sling that goes around and around. And Do you think... Uh, David was a really good shot, or did God guide that stone? Both. Both, yes, that would be my... <laughs> Both, okay. Well, later, later on in the, in the histories, it talks about David and his brave men, and they were all excellent yeah. with slings. Yeah. And it's true. I think what, what was kind of ironic was, um, was Goliath coming out there and being so... He's so confident that he takes his helmet and he yeah. pushes, it back, pushes it back, yeah. kind of opens things up for him to, yeah. to shoot this, the sling um, right into. Yeah. But you know, I, I, I've pondered this often. I, I, I wonder whether he was an acromegaly sufferer. Yeah. And because he obviously was abnormal. It had to be a weakness somewhere. I'm not putting God down, but I distinctly remember a patient we had to deal with. And he was big, and when he went off, he was ugly. But if you got him off balance, you had him. Mm -hmm. Worked every time. Yeah. Well, uh, there's some other possibilities. For those of us who are a little older and wearing glasses, it's possible that, you know, he might have had some little tiny slots in his, in his yes. armor to, to see out of. And he's like, what in the world is yes. this thing yes. this coming at me here? <laughs> is this a dog? And he calls him a dog. You know, along so. the same line that Carrie was talking about, acromegalics have bitemporal vision loss. Mm -hmm. They can only see straight ahead where he's looking. Where, where is that little guy? Yeah, exactly. You know, so he may have also the pos up very for possible, that. very possible. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that David charges down there and he says, "You know, let me kill this giant." No, he says, "The battle is the Lord's, yeah. and I'm going to prove to you that there's a God in Israel." 
So what, how did he view this battle? David? Yeah. He was... I think he'd done what? some praying before he got out there. He'd done a lot of praying. Yes. He, was on, he was God's representative. Yeah. yeah. Well, again, here's the case. Uh, Goliath is making fun of the Israelite God. And here's a young man who says, I will stand up for God's name. And God says, that's all I need. I need somebody who's brave enough to say yes. I think that's a little cocky. Well, if, if don't you think that you and God are a pretty good majority? Well, I don't know. I just <laughs> I think if I had went out there, <clears throat> my stone would have missed or something. <laughs> Well, I don't think you'd go out there unless you, were, you were, had some experience and knew what you were doing with a sling. Well, God was happy to work with David, apparently. Um, unfortunately, that's not the only story we hear about the life of David. And we talk about the high points. He was praised by the women to the point where he made the giant Saul very upset and jealous. Yeah. Then what happened years later when he's wandering on top of his roof to try to keep cool in the afternoon, he looks over and here's Uriah's wife taking a bath. Lost control of his hormones. Yeah, he did. So in, in 2 Samuel 11, 1 to 17, we read that very sad story. And this, of course, is not part of the children's storybook. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, there's kind of evidence as you read his story that he kind of lost control of his hormones a lot. So yeah. it may not have been a something out of the ordinary. Well, I mean, and, and, and having plenty of testosterone probably is useful if you're spending a lot of your life killing people. Yes. And that's what he did. Oh, are you blaming it on testosterone instead of God? Well, I'm, I'm sure not blaming David's uh, fall for Bathsheba on God. No, I'm not. Well, you were talking about battles there. Yeah, oh, yeah. The thing oh. that I've pondered about this here and there is that um, in the end, God, I don't think this is the exact words, called David a man after his own heart. Now, David Hold on. did some pretty horrendous things. Yeah, you've got to remember, if you go back and look carefully at that story, he called David a man after his own heart when he was still a shepherd as a young man. He doesn't say that later in his life. It was later on, but then... However, I will tell you that Ellen White says, at the end, when he really returns to God and he tries to get everything straightened out, I think she actually says he was once more again a man after God's own heart. But that's not in the Bible. In the Bible, the only time he's called a man after God's own heart is in his young days. But don't we more or less believe we might well meet him in heaven? Yeah, well, I mean, he's in the faith chapter, isn't he? Yes, I figure if he gets there, there's hope for some of the rest of us. Yeah. Isn't there? Now, well, when did he lose that, though? What? How did he lose it? Yeah, because he's doing the Lord's work, work, uh, work isn't he? So you do the Lord's work and you he, go down the Did he lose it when he took his second wife or his twelfth wife or his fifteenth wife? Or Well, then at it? some point... So did he lose it when he was killing all those people? Yeah. Did God tell him to kill all those people? I don't think did he lose it when he was collecting those 200 foreskins? Did, did he lose it when he did Goliath? I mean, what's the difference? The difference is Goliath was challenging Yahweh God. Yes. These other people they that weren't? David killed weren't. They weren't? How do you know? Well, I, I don't know that for sure. <laughs> but we don't have it stated that, that they were. Goliath yeah. was challenging God. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I was just... Well, the one thing I can say about the end of David's life is we go to Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, both Psalms which seem to be, seem to have been written shortly after David, you know, God confronts David through the prophet and said, you're the man. And he, he sincerely repents. There, I don't think anybody can argue about the fact that there's a sincere repentance. He paid a lot of, he paid a lot of money. He paid a bad price for that. Four of his sons ended up being, yeah. dying over that process, that whole thing. Well, do we have our own private battles that God might be involved with in one way or another? Nobody, don't, you don't need to confess right now, but. 
God is fully aware of every temptation we face, right? Of course, who else is aware of every temptation that he, can, he brings to us? The devil. The devil. He's busy poking them in our heads. So what, what, are we, what does that tell us? <clears throat> we're, remember, we're talking about the great controversy here. It's a wrong wouldn't, battle. Wouldn't that, be, wouldn't that be the same thing uh, as David confronting Goliath? Isn't the accusation the same? Isn't, isn't Satan accusing God because yeah. of, of what our life has become, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. The, we need to make it very clear that the great controversy happens between our ears. That's where the great controversy happens. This, so, is, not, this is not some physical battle with armies, whatever. It's inside us. So I can, uh, I can, I can defeat those giants that, that come along in my life. I can get my own little... My own little kinds oh. of stones that I can fling and... Well, let's think about that. How, how would that work? That was my question. Okay. Well, let's, <laughs> the less, this lesson is supposed to be about that question. So let's hold and maybe we can come to some conclusions by the time we get to the end. Remember the story of Elijah, 1 Kings 17 to 19. I like to try to imagine the conversation, the first conversation that took place between Elijah and God... Here's Elijah living in a tiny little village on the other side of the Jordan River, up on the high plateau. See, there he is up there. And God shows up one day, I don't know what form or just to a voice or what, and says, I need you to go down and tell Ahab he's, not, he's doing bad things. Remembering that if you approached one of these kings in Ahab's day and he didn't like what you had to say, he could have your head cut off without anybody raising any questions at all. Well, um, Ahab, if he lacked the courage to do that, he'd just... Let somebody else do it. Let, let Jezebel know what was happening yes. and she would do it. <laughs> <He'd> organize it. <laughs> so you think Elijah was just doing his own thing and then God all of a sudden told him to go do this. I think Elijah was a man of God, a man of prayer and probably, you know, tried to be a man of God, and God says, there's somebody I can work with. What he, he was, he was faithful in his life in the little things. Yeah. So God knew he would be faithful in a big thing, and I've got a big job over here. You know, what's always bothered me about that story is that when he went up to the king to tell him it was going to rain, he says, it's not going to rain until I say so. He doesn't say until God says so. He says till I say so. So well, it almost, it almost, to me, acts like that. Him and God had a discussion, and maybe He said, if we could only do this stuff, this and that, that and the other thing, yeah. then uh, you know everything would be fine. How come you don't do this? And then, okay, let's try it out. That's that's kind of how I see it. And you know what happened? Well, remember. With the, Remember, in light of your story, two things. One, Jezebel has 850 prophets there. She's the daughter, a high priestess of Baal from Sidon, her, where her father was, was the high priest and, and the king of Sidon. And yeah. he ruled that territory. She came over with all the, I don't know if she, if she bought them from over there or she just recruited them after she got to Israel. But her job, her a vowed purpose was to, con was to convert the Israelites to being Baal worshipers. Yeah. Okay? Okay, this is my second That's point to is... to keep them from going down to the south and right. worshiping down there. Well, whatever. Okay? The second thing is, this is what the Word says about your comment about Elijah. I, First Kings 17, I'm reading here, a prophet named Elijah from Tishbe in Gilead, that's over on the other side of Jordan, said to King Ahab, in the name of the Lord, the living God of Israel, so who's he speaking up on behalf of? God. He's talking on behalf of Yahweh and is opposed to the God that you're trying to force on us, whom I serve, I tell you that there will be no dew or rain for the next two or three years until I say so. So I don't think it was 
He's, well, he, he was bragging there. Nobody's going to be dumb enough to go in, the, go in there unless they had confidence that the Lord was powerful enough to preserve him. There's no doubt about that. But, you know, possibly the discussion here between this prophet and the God and God was being carried out here. And I'm not quite sure if, if, um, if it was completely God's idea, just, just because of what happens at the end. Yeah. When, when he goes into the cave and he says, I'm no different than anybody else, that, than my ancestors. And, um, and that, when you put those two together, that's how I, why I come up with that. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I so, suspect this wasn't the first contact no. that Elijah had with God as no. being a prophet. This is just the first thing that we have recorded. Yeah, I think so. I think he'd been a man of God for years. Yeah. Well, obviously, I so mean, that's why what did, they what did such Elijah good do? Friends. He disappeared. Where'd he go? He went back almost to where his hometown was, back to Gilead, across the Jordan, and to a place, he, and he hid out in a ravine where there was a small brook called the Brook Cherith. I've actually had the privilege of visiting there and taking pictures. Should have brought some of them with me, shouldn't I? He lay, stayed there until the brook, brook went completely dry. Then he headed north, and he, he went to the town of Zarephath. Where is Zarephath? Right next to Jezebel's home. Right next to where Jezebel grew up. Right under the nose of Jezebel's father. And what did, what did Ahab and Jezebel do at that point? They sent messages. If you read the, I, we don't have time to read all the details, but they sent messages to every king, every country around them. Says, "Here's the guy. This is what he looks like. If you see him, arrest him and bring him to us." <laughs> never, never thinking he'd be right under, right under their nose. And then I, you, and I don't, I don't want to get too detailed. I love this story. There are lots of details, but imagine if you lived in a small town. I grew up in a town with 500 people. Okay, 500 people. If you live in a small town and some strange, strange man shows up and he moves in with a widow and her son and they never run out of food, do you think they would stick out like a sore thumb? Wish Telegraph would be around that group in no time. <laughs> you wonder how, how it was that nobody figured it out. Anyway, of course, Elijah, finally God says, okay, now it's time to go back. He goes over there. He talks to um, Obadiah first, the Ahab servant who was a God-fearing man. Then he talks to Ahab and he says, okay, here's the deal. I'm calling you to meet me at the top of Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is a, a range of mountains that actually extends. It gets higher and higher. Is that it approaches right out at the, at the edge of the Mediterranean Sea, and then it drops right off. And so he said, meet on the top of Mount Carmel, right next to um, a huge city there in, in Israel today. He said, bring your prophets, prophets of Baal, prophets of Asterisk, bring them, and we'll have a showdown. Okay? And you know, all know what happened. These guys jumped and danced and carried on. I mean, 850. You would think 850 of them, they would figure. I'm sure they thought we could figure out how to sort of crowd around here a little bit and we'll hide some fire here and we'll slip it in there. What happened? Nothing. 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 And then after they'd done their thing, here comes Elijah. He's one man. He says, okay, step back. Here's the altar of the Lord. Fix it up put on the wood, put on the bull, it was a calf probably, and uh, pour on the water, and he prays, and what was the sky like? No clouds. Not a cloud clouds anywhere. This is a bright blue sky, and out of the bright blue sky, gazap, lightning. And try to imagine what you would think if you watched that happening. But after all that happened, there was no impression on anybody. Oh, after yeah. It was gone. Well, oh, yes. They said, God, he is Lord. God, he is Lord. For how long? Well, unfortunately, long. unfortunately, Elijah should have followed up with his, 
with his advantage there, and he didn't. What, what advantage is that? Well, he just wiped out all the prophets of Baal. Oh. He should have said, God, we're going we're gonna to go around, we're going to go from village to village, and we're going to say, okay, guys, who is the powerful God here? It's time to get rid of these idols. It's time to do... He didn't. That, that would have done it? Well, it would have helped anyway. Well, it seems I, like he took Ahab and took him somewhere, didn't he, to, to try to... Um, took Ahab back home. Yeah, he took him back home in the rainstorm. Yeah, exactly. And th so this should be ample evidence that God is the most powerful. Absolutely. Boy, and well. yet, you know what happened? Yeah. Well, and then that, that's the story. Took off running. That's the story, time and time again. You, you think of the story of the flood. You know, you would think something that monumental, uh, people would yeah. would remember or think of, or or but they they just discount it. Well, I think that I think that that whole episode just floored Elijah so much that that the Lord says, "Get ready, I'm, you're going to come with me, and I, you're going to watch what I'm going to do." And that's when he went up to heaven. When I when I when I hear this story and the story that lightning come out of the blue sky, I think of it very funny thing that happened when I was a child. We were traveling back from New England, back to Idaho, and a farmer drove right across in front of us. We totaled our car. So my father had to buy a brand new 1956 Ford. Uh, it was the very first model that had all this, you know, recessed steering, steering wheel and seat belts and, I mean, all the safety equipment. And one of the other things that had in it was a uh, an automatic window washer. You know, you push a button and the water would squirt out. And it was <laughs> out on the hood in those days, and it would squirt out, and so they were expecting you to be driving along 40, 50, 60 miles an hour, so it would squirt out there and it hit your window. See? So we, we were visiting my grandparents in, in Nevada, and we, the two of us were sitting there after church, my brother and I sitting in the car, and my grandfather, who was completely bald, was <laughs> I'm sorry, I figured about this. Standing talking to one of his friends right next to my, our car, and unfortunately my brother decided it was the right time to push the button. <laughs> Water comes squirting out right on the top of my grandfather's head. You know, <laughs> it's raining and there's not a cloud in this <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you know, just think of the, the, the impact of, it, of something like that. So, anyway... We need to move on. We, we think about God acting in, in, at this point in time. And everybody, the children of Israel all responded, God, Yahweh, He is God, Yahweh, He is God. Um, do we recognize in our day-by-day -day lives that uh, God is the only one who gives us life and takes care of us? Makes it possible for us to breathe and our heart to beat? I love this quotation from Ellen White in Review and Herald, December 2 of 1890, where she said, Every pulsation of the heart is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now, I mean, obviously, you're not talking about God literally doing this, but she says, it's only because of God's power that even our hearts beat. Well, moving on to um, Hezekiah. What happened to Hezekiah? The northern country of Israel had already fallen to the Assyrians. And a little while later, about 20 years later, Sennacherib and his crew come back and says, okay, it's time for us to, to take Judah. And he threatens him first, and so Hezekiah says, oh, please, please, we'll send you all this money, just go away. He takes almost all the money in Jerusalem and sends it up there, and, and Sennacherib says, thank you very much, but we're coming anyway. And they, they completely conquered all of Judah except Jerusalem. They were surrounding Jerusalem. And then what happened? They lost all his army. Similar well, Hezekiah decided there was nobody left to turn to except God. And he consulted Isaiah and they prayed. And what had happened, what, what happened just before all that happened? What, what about the conversation that took place? Do you remember? The general 
from uh, from Assyria mm -hmm. oh, said, yes. "Your God's worthless." Basically, mm -hmm. it was yes. what what he was saying, yeah. and he talked in the language that the People Israelites the could, could understand, uh, rather than his native tongue. And so everyone heard, you know, making fun of God, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a case of okay, because the Assyrians worshipped the god of war. And they believed their God was powerful enough to be able to conquer everyone around. They thought there was no question in their mind that their God was more powerful. I mean, they had already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. They hadn't thought about the fact that maybe there was a problem with Israel's relationship with God, but they had already conquered the northern kingdom of Israel. And they thought, okay, these people at least claim to be worshippers of the same God. We wiped them out. Why can't we wipe out the country of Judah as well? So what happened? During the night, all the soldiers, were, Sennacherib's soldiers, were killed. They, walk, they woke up and found themselves dead. Mm -hmm. Well, they woke up and found themselves dead? The okay, Israelites that's woke up and found 185,000 <laughs> Assyrians that's dead good, outside. Uh, no opposition. <laughs> it's very interesting to read the passage here. Um, after the, at the end of the whole story, it's found in second. You can read Second Kings nineteen, or you can read Isaiah thirty-seven there verbatim. Um, this is what the Lord Who has said. Who you, you, weren't, you weren't supposed to ask that question. <laughs> this is what the, no Isaiah was almost certainly written before Second Kings, so it was probably Second Kings that we copied Isaiah. This is what the Lord has said about the Assyrian emperor. He will not enter this city or shoot a single arrow against it. No soldiers with shields will come near the city and no siege mounds will be built round it. He will go back by the same road he came without entering the city. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will defend this city and protect it for the sake of my own honor. What's he doing here? Reinforcing that he is the God. Yeah, he's, he's standing up for his own name, in the, really, in the, in the eyes of the surrounding nations, isn't he? And, and, because and, the pro Israel. Yeah, and because of the promise I made to my servant David. That night, an angel of the Lord went down, I'm, I'm sorry, went to the Assyrian camp and killed 185,000 soldiers. At dawn the next day, there they lay, all dead. Makes you wonder who cleaned that mess up. Yeah. The birds. Well, considering how they lived those days, there's no bulldozers anywhere. No. No, it weren't. You know, it's, it's interesting, though, that the people that were doing all this accusations against God, saying that he was weak and all that, well, they just died. They couldn't, nobody told them anything different. They were just dead after that. They... There, there was no point being made to them because they were not alive to have the point made to them. Yeah. So it looks like the point just went to Israel. And Israel and to the people, to Sennacherib, who did not die, no, gone and his, some of his generals who went back home. <coughs> I mean, imagine they're they showing... die afterwards, though. Yeah. Imagine they're showing up back at Nineveh. With nobody. <laughs> with nobody. which would, would be a rather stark testimony mm -hmm. in that these were soldiers and the God that they were serving and the one that they expected would give them victory um, was the one that showed up powerless. Yes. Well, so if, if, if this, the, the Assyrian God is the God of war, mm -hmm. What is the Israelite God? What is he a God of? What is, what is our God a God of? Love. That's the only single word I know of in the Bible to describe God. I mean, it, one word. I mean, he's also kind and faithful and all those other things, but, but the one word that the Bible uses to describe God is love. If you're and interested love. in serving a god of war, that would be kind of a wimpy god that you want to <laughs> serve and serve a god like that. Maybe you could say he protects his own. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
experts love Especially when but he, and he's, he, he protects his reputation. He has to. Mm -hmm. He did it in Egypt. He did it here. He did it repeatedly. If you read through the book of, of Ezekiel again and again and again, God has to, I do this for my own namesake. I have a whole handout that's on our website for my own namesake. Again and again and again, God says, you're not behaving, you're not, you're not obeying me, but I have to do this for my own namesake. I can hear, hear people saying, well, that, that's a little narcissistic. Okay. This, this God is a, is, is a narcissist. Would, would, you, would you prefer to worship, would you really prefer to worship a, a wimpy God who never does, does anything for you? Well... Come on but, he's, but he's not doing something for me. He's doing something for himself. He doesn't oh. want his own reputation but if he, if to be he can do, here. If he can do something for himself, he can do something for you, can't he? Well, well I, that's I, not I, what he's doing here. <laughs> I think it's, it's mostly keeping the truth out in the open. Yeah. Uh, if he's the only God and people get the idea that there's all these other gods that can beat this one God that they talk about, the truth is the truth's going to be hidden right there. So, 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 what's so important about his reputation? What's but so God, important about his we, name? Well, because his name involves his character and the kind of government he he runs. If we if we don't believe in that kind of God and that kind of a government and that kind of plan, then we have no, there's no chance for us to be saved. If it's a law, you become like the person yeah. or that you worship or admire, and you have an arbitrary, vengeful God, mm -hmm. uh, which is the opposite of love. Yeah. Love means you have to have a choice, mm -hmm. and the choice doesn't come through coercion, duress, extortion, and so forth. Freedom to choose is a very, it's the way God is. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a fact. It's a, mm -hmm. a statement of fact. So is this God on multiple occasions leveling the playing field so that people have a live option to choose him well, rather than yeah. the God of the okay. Philistines, the uh, God of... Very good point. Let's think about this for a moment. What weapons does Satan use in his fight against God? Deception, extortion. Coercion, deception, extortion, lies. lies. I mean, go every possible thing that he can think of. What weapons does God have? Truth. Truth and love. Now try to think about it. Does it sound like a, 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 a level playing field? You got truth and love versus all those other things. Well, the other thing though, the, all the lies and everything, they, they, they turn around and bite the people that do it after a while. Yeah. So in a way, there's, there's some kind of equalization happening there too. <laughs> Sin pays its wage. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we need to go to the book of the story of Esther. What happened with Esther? Esther was an orphan girl. Both of her parents are dead. She ends up being taken care of and growing up with, with her cousin. And for some reason, they're in the city of Susa. What, what do we know about Susa? Was it the capital of? Uh, it was of one of the capitals of, of, of the Persian Empire. Mm -hmm. How, where was it in relationship to Babylon? Do you remember? Further east. Further uh, east, yeah. away from Jerusalem, away from Judah. Why? Es the Esther story doesn't happen until more than 100 years after they were taken into captivity, more than 60 years after Cyrus said, go home. So why are Esther and her cousins still over in Susa? They didn't go home. They're being bad. <laughs> They're being missionaries. If they were, if they were really faithful Jews, should they have not gone home, or shouldn't they have gone home? You would think so. God called them to do that. Yeah. At least He allowed them to. Now it's possible. It's possible that Mordecai was some kind of representative of the Jewish people there in the, in the government. Um, we don't have any solid evidence for that, but I suppose that's a possibility, so we shouldn't rule that out. Um, if you read Esther 2, 6 and 7, there's an interesting little note. 
Look at those verses. When King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon took King Jehoiakim of Judah into exile from Jerusalem, that was in the days of Ezekiel, that would be 597, 598 BC, along with a group of captives, Mordecai was among them. He had a cousin, Esther, whose Hebrew name was Hadassah. She was a beautiful young woman and had a good figure. At the death of her parents, Mordecai adopted her and brought her up as his own daughter. And it sounds like Mordecai is several, more than 100 years old, doesn't it? If you look at the calendar. <laughs> but if you read the King James Version more, some of the older versions, it will say uh, this. Um, now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjaminite, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, and that would be, that would be um, uh, Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Whom, so it, who was being carried away? Well, either Jair or Kish were the ones who were carried away. Uh, and so there are some translations that give you a false impression when you read that. Um, it's, it wasn't Mordecai that was carried away those many years before it was one of his ancestors. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so what do we know, what we do know about the story is what? What do we know about the story? Esther was beautiful, okay? All you guys, come on, you've got to she recognize that. She was one of that. the king's favorites. She ended up being the favorite queen, according to the story, if we can read it right. Uh, by the way, he's sometimes called King Xerxes, and sometimes he's called King Ahasuerus. Do you know have any idea why he has two different names? Different language. Believe it or not, it's exactly the same name. If you take it from Persian and you take it into Greek and into English, it's Xerxes. If you take it from Persian into Hebrew and English, it's Ahasuerus. Mm -hmm. Same name, exactly. It's just by the time you take it through these di other languages, it comes out so different. Mm. So then there was another guy involved in the story. What was his name? Good old Haman. Haman. What do we know about Haman? He was an Amalekite. Not only that, he was a senator of the kings of the Amalekites. What do we know the, about the Amalekites? They were the very ones that Saul was supposed to destroy. That's right. Take, destroy them all, and he said, but I brought the sheep and some of the kings, some of the representatives, as a present for God. Yes. And that's when Saul declared that he was rejected by God. Yeah. But there, we know something about the Amalekites even before that. Do you know what happened before that? Well, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, they, uh, they gave them a hard time. Yeah. They tried to attack them. In fact, they didn't even attack them face on. The children of Israel are streaming down toward Mount Sinai, they just had barely come out of Egypt, and some of the stragglers at the back, and the Amalekites attacked the stragglers at the back. Mm -hmm. And killed a few, quite a few people. And Moses says, hold on here, we got to get ourselves organized, we're not here as an army. And what happened in that battle? Do you remember? Moses stood up on the hill, oh, yeah, the hill and when they held his hands up, the Israelites won, and as soon as they let, he got tired and put his hands down, what happened? The Malachites came back. So who was actually winning the war? God. God, obviously. What do you think that symbolized? Just what it said. Well, I mean, why? Why? Well, well it makes a big point about the arms being up versus okay. down. The, and then it doesn't. the whole point is to say this war was God's war and not their war. They were not prepared in any way to fight a fierce group of people like the Amalekites. But what's with the hands up versus the well, hands down? Well, it's not the hands up or down so much as the fact that they recognize it. I mean, I hope everybody recognizes the fact that Moses is standing over on a hill somewhere with his hands up. That's not going to have any direct impact on the battle unless it's God doing it. So when his hands go down, well, oh. Why couldn't he keep them up? Well, you're tired. Keep, you no, I, I think I think it's the people tall. holding the arms up. It's it's, it's symbolizing that the Lord is put sure. giving him strength. That that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> that was Joshua that was holding one arm up and 
her, Caleb? Her, Aaron and her, I think it was. Was it? it? Okay, maybe. Something like that, but anyway. Maybe it was Aaron and Joshua. I didn't. Okay. Well, anyway, Haman says, you know, there are these, he didn't like Mordecai not bowing down to him, so he plans this, this, this scheme, and he tells the king, there's these really strange people that don't fit in with anybody, and they worship, they worship other gods, and so forth, and Really, your, your country would be better off if we got rid of these people, right? They're troublemakers. Troublemakers. Ellen White says in Prophets and Kings, page 600 to 601, little did the king realize the far-reaching results that would have accompanied the complete carrying out of this decree. That is, the tree destroyed the, the Jews. Satan himself, the hidden instigator of the scheme, was trying to rid the earth of those who preserve the knowledge of the true God. So what did Satan recognize? He knew that Christ was that coming. God himself is supposed to come through this line right. someday. And if I can destroy this line, I've won. Yep. Well, and these people are an influence yep. for good where they are. But aren't they kind of a burr people out somewhere else? I mean, the, where the God was coming from was the people that went back to Jerusalem. But it was so, throughout the kingdom, no. throughout the kingdom that, that the Jews were supposed to be destroyed. Everybody. Not just, all, not just in Even Susa. Jerusalem? Yes. Absolutely. Oh, yes. Everywhere, Absolutely. Yeah. All the Jews were supposed to be destroyed. Everywhere. Okay. So, of course, Esther was challenged by her cousin to stand up for her people and was ultimately successful. Very clever. The way she did that. Sly. But, Result, sly, okay, resulting in the hanging of their anim, arch enemy Haman on the very gallows Haman had constructed to kill Mordecai. Incredible. Well, and as the story goes, um, Xerxes asked Haman what he thought should happen to yeah. somebody who was such a, a despicable character. And well, not Haman, a, Haman, not a despicable character. What? What should be done to the man the king wants to honor? Right. And Mordecai had saved his life. Right. And uh, Haman was describing something. He was sure he was the one. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, no, Mordecai is is I mean Haman is is dis accusing the Jews of being different and worshiping differently than others did. Does that remind you of anything in the New Testament? Revelation. Revelation 13, verse 15 says, The second beast was allowed to breathe life into the image of the first beast so that the image could talk and put to death all those who would not worship it. What does that tell us? If you go back earlier in that same chapter, look at verses 34 and, I mean, sorry, 3 and 4, and then 7 and 8. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have been fatally wounded, but the wound had healed. The whole earth was amazed and followed the beast. You think there will ever be a time when everybody in the, agree, in the earth, or pretty much everybody in the earth, agrees on anything? Everyone, it says, worshipped the dragon because he had given his authority to the beast. They worshipped the beast also, saying, who is like the beast? so forth and so forth. And then it was allowed to fight against God's people. If you look at verses 7 and 8, it was allowed to fight against God's people and to defeat them, and it was given authority over every tribe, nation, language, and race. All people on, living on earth will worship it except those whose names were written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. Wow. So I think one day we will have to stand up and do things as cleverly as Esther did? I think when you see what's currently on the world format of activity, it's not that hard to believe. Yeah. Well, we come now to Nehemiah as we're running out of time. Nehemiah was a faithful servant of King Artaxerxes. Now, this would be several, what, three or four generations after, behind, after Xerxes. Well, not even three or four. One generation, I guess, a couple generations after Xerxes. Both Artaxerxes and Nehemiah were no doubt familiar with the stories of Esther, Haman, and Mordecai. But things were not going well back in Jerusalem. 
Look at Nehemiah 1, 1 to 4. This is the account of what Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah, accomplished. In the month of Kislev, in the twentieth year that Arxerxes was emperor of Persia, I, Nehemiah, was in Susa, the capital city. Hanani, one of my brothers, arrived from Judah with another group, and I asked them about Jerusalem and about, one, about our fellow Jews who had returned from exile in Babylonia. They told me that those who had survived were back in the homeland were in the great difficulty and then that the foreigners who lived nearby looked down on them. They also told me that the walls of Jerusalem were still broken down and that the gates had not been restored since the time they were burnt. When I heard all this, I sat down and wept. Why is it that the walls weren't established and the, the, the gates were burnt? Do you remember the, the details of the story? The opposition of the Samaritans. Every time the Jews would try to do something, one of their enemies from around there would bring a, come up with their army and burn down whatever they had done or knock it down. And they, they, they finally just sort of gave up. Then Nehemiah prays. He, he mourns and he fasts and he prays. And let me just read this. It'll take a moment or two. Lord God of heaven, you are great and we stand in fear of you. You faithfully keep your covenant with those who love you and do what you command. Look at me, Lord, and hear my prayers. I pray day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess that we, the people of Israel, have sinned. My ancestors and I have sinned. We have acted wickedly against you and have not done what you commanded. We have not kept the laws which you gave us to Moses, your servant. Remember now what you told Moses. If you, you people of Israel are unfaithful to me, I will scatter you among the other nations. But then if you turn back to me and do what I have commanded you, I will bring you back to the place where I have chosen to be worshipped, and even though, you are even though you are scattered to the ends of the earth. Lord, these are your servants, your own people. You rescued them by your great power and strength. Listen now to my prayer and to the prayers of all your other servants who want to honor you. Give me success today and mark the make the emperor merciful to me. In those days I was the emperor's wine steward and so forth. So, what was he praying for? To help Jerusalem be established, reestablished. In order to honor who? To honor God. Yeah, to honor God's reputation. That's what it was for. Well, so what happened? Nehemiah one day looked a little sad, apparently. And the emperor said, hmm, why are you looking sad? And Nehemiah had to report, tell the truth. He told him, and the emperor says, well, I'll give you money. I'll give you what, you what do you need to rebuild that city. And what did Nehemiah do? That's what they did. They got things organized and finished it pretty quick. Yeah. Under well, the he, cover of darkness, he inspected and mm, found out what needed to be done. He did his homework, and didn't he? 52 yeah. days later, it was done. Yep. And, they, and how did they manage to accomplish it in 52 days? They were working long hours. In fact, he said, for a long time, I didn't even take my clothes off. I was day and night, and they had to work with a sword in one hand and a, and a hammer in the other hand, basically, didn't they? That's some subcontractors in there. Yeah, whatever. But they, I mean, they just, they were, they were not hesitating for anything, because they knew that the, the other guys could send a message to the emperor, and the emperor might come back and say, okay, stop. And Nehemiah says, we're not taking any chances on anything like that happening. This wall has got to be finished, and these gates got to be finished. We've got to be done ASAP. And they did. What, so, but ne Nehemiah's prayer is a lot like N Daniel's prayer in, in Daniel chapter 9. He says, God, do this for your name's sake, for your reputation. Do we ever pray for God's reputation? I hope so. I do a lot. Maybe it, I, I, it's something that seems really important to me. Well, when we, when we face our daily activities, I would think one of the things that should be in our mind is that as we do things, at least sometimes, mm -hmm. these are thoughts that come to my mind, is that I don't want to be embarrassment yeah. to God. Yeah, absolutely. And when we pray the Lord's Prayer, what do we say? Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done, right? What is that telling us? Do we ever face friends, neighbors, associates at work who make fun of us, our church, or the principles which we believe are important? Are we afraid to speak up on God's behalf on those occasions? Are there any times today when God's the truths about God are made fun of? We, we live pretty comfortable lives, right? In the Western world today where we have religious freedom, Adventists do pretty well. We're told it's not always going to be like that. Now that's the way it is where you and I are. Yeah. That's not the way it is in some places where members of our faith are. Do you think that if the day comes when a group of us, hopefully, um, stand up firmly for God and speak the truth and God says, okay, I've got my group ready, you think Satan is going to stand by quietly and just watch things happen? Well, the question is whether God will stand by quietly and let things happen. Yeah, exactly. Do we, do we think God is just as active, just as a bit able to do things in our day as he did in those ancient times? Absolutely. Well, yes. In the minute or so we have left, let's come back to our question. We think about David and Goliath. We think about Elijah versus the prophets of Baal, Hezekiah versus Sennacherib, Esther versus Haman, just to take an example, um, Nehemiah against his enemies. What do we learn about God from all those stories? We have emphasized the fact that God acts very, very forcefully sometimes, especially when his reputation is called into question, right? He shows up when you need him. He shows up when you need them. Are there times and places in our day when God's name and reputation are being challenged? Constantly. What about all the people in our world who don't believe that God even exists? And they certainly don't believe he's creator of everything. <clears throat> well, we believe, we've been taught, that God at the end is going to slowly remove his influence from this world and let Satan have more and more power. What do you think those times are going to be like? Well, I hope you've enjoyed our discussion. You've got some ideas to think about. We need to keep praying. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to serve you and to try to honor your name the best we can. We ask that you will also keep us faithful to you so that you can honor our names as well. Help us to be faithful to your cause so that that time will come soon when Jesus can appear in the clouds is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.